Throughout history, free thinkers have outraged the religious with their wacky ideas about the virtues of free speech, reason, and of course, eating babies. Now, God is dying, and it's time to dispose of his remains. From the pits of hell, Satan sends two puppets of the imperialist West and the Zionist Jews against God, Islam, and tiny kittens to bring you their propaganda and conspire for a new world order. This is Secular Jihadist for a Muslim Enlightenment with Ali Rizwi and Armin Navabi. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Secular Jihadists for a Muslim Enlightenment. We've got a very, very important episode right now. We're recording this near the end of September. This is the eve of the very first uh, presidential debate, and there's been a lot going on, something that should actually affect a lot of uh, secularists, you know, people who are secular, atheists, agnostic. Um, Trump has nominated a, 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 a candidate for the Supreme Court, uh, Amy Coney Barrett, uh, to replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, and uh, she is obviously a very sort of far right, uh, Catholic, very religious person um, who has vocally expressed uh, her preference for. I mean, what she has said that you know she doesn't really, if it comes to interpreting the Constitution, which is very vague, versus following precedent, she would go with the Constitution. She doesn't care as much about precedent. So a lot of things are at stake in the U.S. Church-state separation, reproductive rights, healthcare. Obamacare's probably pretty much gone if she gets on. Um, LGBTQ rights, possibly. Um, they were looking at a six, six, three, six to three uh, conservative majority Supreme Court. So what will America look like with a six to three conservative majority Supreme Court? And what is the future of secularism in the US? So uh, we had one episode about this where Armin and I talked about it. This time we got actually what, one of my favorite people, uh, Andrew Seidel, uh, he is a constitutional attorney. He is the author of uh, a fantastic book called The Founding Myth, Why Christian Nationalism is Un-American. And he has been very, very busy for the last few days. <laughs> He's joining us from Wisconsin, which is obviously, it's a swing state. So, um, Andrew, welcome back. You know, it's, it's so good to have you back. Gentlemen, thank you so much for having me on again. It is a pleasure to be with you. I'm sad it is under such awful circumstances. Uh, much better last time just talking about the book. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Here you, you wrote a book. You wrote a book, The Founding Myth, you know, where Christian nationalism is American. Now uh, we have, uh, we're looking at uh, this Amy Coney Barrett uh, going to the Supreme Court. And I, the way that I look at it is I think that she's almost certain to make it on. Um, and I <laughs> hoping we we're looking to you for maybe some hope or some ideas about what, what uh, potentially can happen from here onwards. What is the future of the Supreme court? So uh, how have you, uh, how do you see the situation, the, the, this nomination, the death of Ginsburg and, and what the Supreme court's going to look like in the near future with the election coming up? Yeah. I mean, first let's just take a brief moment because Ruth Bader Ginsburg was just amazing. Oh, she yeah. was a Titan. Her loss is, it's really, really hard to take. She was mm -hmm. one of the two staunchest, most vocal defenders of the separation of state and church of secularism uh, on the court. And one of the most, the staunchest in the history of the court. And it's been especially hard to handle because it was immediately politicized. Her death was immediately politicized. Yeah. And you know, I, there's not really been a chance to like, to, to pause and just appreciate her outsized legacy and mourn. Instead, we have to fight as she did. And Ali, I think, you know, what you touched on in the beginning, it was right on the money. Everything is at stake right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything, Roe versus Wade, racial equality, LGBTQ equality, our earth, or at least our ability to survive on the earth, our healthcare, our healthcare, Americans' healthcare is at risk in the middle of a pandemic that has killed 200,000 Americans. Certainly the separation of state and church as we know it, all of these hang in the balance. They hang in the balance right now. And if this happens too, you know, there's little that's not going to be on the table in the future, right? Like the end of Roe versus Wade is going to open a new front in the war against women's rights and reproductive justice. They're not mm -hmm. done with Roe versus Wade. They're coming for birth control next. So the stakes are as high as they have ever been. If you are an American, you better get on the goddamn phone and call your senator and tell them to stop this nonsense. 
Uh, the capital switchboard is 202-224-3121-202-224-3121. Call them, let them hear a piece of your mind. You've got to do that. Okay, we're going to put that number actually in at least the people watching this on YouTube, at least will be able to, or listening to this on YouTube, are going to be able to get this number um, for the switchboard. We could put it in the description. Put it in the description. Um, the public version of it, we'll put it in the description. Right. Thank you guys. Fantastic. Yeah, and we'll have this. We'll have this. We'll have this one public version of this release very soon yeah. because it's so, very time sensitive. I, so, so what? Yeah. So the the main question here is that you know you're looking at like we're about four weeks from the election. Okay. Uh, well, let, let's pause. Let's pause because the election's happening. We, we're in the election. The election is happening right now. I've, I've already voted. I'm done voting. Um, the election is happening. So we're not. The election's not 35 days away. We're ha it's in it. We're we're there. Good point. Okay, that's the, the totally. That's it. That's actually a great point. So the election is happening. People are already early voting. You know, they're sending in their ballots and all that. Um, so we're in a situation where, um, you know. November 3rd is coming up. That's when we're going to know, uh, or a little while after that, we're going to know what happens with the results of the election. And until then, uh, Congress is in session for a limited number of days. Usually these uh, Supreme Court nominees have to be vetted. There's like several days of hearings and, you know, they, there's a lot of sort of loops that they have to, hoops that they have to jump through before that you get nominated. Um, is it possible to get it done? And what are some of the strategies that Democrats can use to stall it until after November 3rd? And is it is it practical to be able to do that? Are you optimistic? Sure. sure. I mean, there it is possible that they could jam this nomination through uh, before the end of October. It's possible. Uh, I mean, the, the the GOP, the Republicans control the rules. They can they can change them. Um, we, we, I mean, this whole nomination, they're changing the rules on this. Uh, it, it is it is possible that they can do it. It is our job as citizens to do two things. To one, put as much pressure on them to not jam this nomination through. And two, to put pressure on the Democrats to oppose them. To do everything within their power to, as you said, delay. There are a number of different tactics they can use. I think that the number one thing that people need to realize, right, is the, the Republicans right now seem united. They have made public statements. Mitch McConnell thinks he has the votes and it appears, appears to be a foregone conclusion, but it's not. And I think if, right, if this whole thing tells us anything, it's that politicians go back on their word all the fucking time, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't be in this fight right now. And we can win this. If people remember back to the end of July 2017, when we, the people, spoke up and saved the Affordable Care Act, right? It was on the chopping block, on the Senate floor. So many people thought it was impossible, but so many people called their senator, showed up, took action, protested, and fought. They fought John for their McCain. rights. And yeah, and John McCain did the famous thumbs down. So we have to keep fighting against this open seat until the last vote is cast. And the number one thing to take away is even if we lose, we have to fight. And that just means that we have a bigger battle ahead because it's certainly, certainly not going to be the end. Armin. Can we get a little bit back to the basics? And can you just explain to people who is Amy Barrett and why she's a problem? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Uh, Amy Barrett is a, she was a law professor. Okay. I mean, she was, that was what she did. She wasn't a practicing lawyer. She, for instance, never tried an appellate case in her entire, entire career. Uh, so she wasn't a practicing lawyer. She was one of the ivory tower people that Trumpkins ra rail against all the time. Okay? Trump nominated her to sit on an appeals court. Uh, so one step below the U.S. Supreme Court, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals uh, in 2017. And she was put on that seat uh, in November. So she's been a judge for less than three years. Very young and doesn't have the experience to be a Supreme Court nominee. That's the number one thing I think people will need to take away. The simple fact that she has accepted this nomination shows that she is unfit to sit on the Supreme Court. It shows that she is partisan and it shows that she lacks the integrity to sit in the seat that Ruth Bader Ginsburg occupied for so long. Um, and then the bigger problem that I think you're having me on to chat about is she is a Christian nationalist. She is a very conservative Catholic, uh, of a, and she belongs to this charismatic uh, Catholic sect that's been called a cult 
by former members uh, and has written in law review articles and has said that when her faith and the law collide, that her faith should trump the law. Uh, and that is a huge problem for us. So you're hearing right now, you know, all these claims of anti-Catholic bigotry, which is total nonsense for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that the Democratic candidate, Joe Biden, is a Catholic. Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, is a Catholic. There are already five Catholics on the Supreme Court. Uh, she will be the sixth or seventh, depending, including Sonia Sotomayor, who was nominated by the Democrat. Uh, I mean, if Joe Biden wins, when Joe Biden wins, he'll be the, the first Catholic president since JFK. Uh, so the idea that there's anti-Catholic bias floating around is nonsense. The problem is that Amy Coney Barrett has written that her religion should guide her judicial decisions. It should trump her duty to the Constitution. And that's a massive, massive problem. And if you want to get into those weeds, I'm happy to take you. There. Yes, please, because we I see a lot of arguments right now from conservatives that saying that uh, that this is fear mongering, that there's a lot of uh, mm -hmm. that she actually there's a lot of precedent to show that she will. Um, her personal opinions will not get in the way that she is um, not like an activist judge, uh, that she is just for upholding the law, not to, she's, you know, just to do, look at the Constitution and just abide by the Constitution. And this is just a pathetic attempt by the liberals to try to scare people. So how do you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, it, it, this is a it's a manufactured controversy. What they are trying to do, what the Republicans are trying to do is muzzle legitimate questions about whether or not she will turn to her religion or her holy book instead of to the Constitution when she's dealing with cases like LGBTQ rights, abortion rights and the death penalty. And, you know, one of the biggest pieces of evidence we have is in 1998, she wrote a law review article. Amy, so Amy Coney Barrett, uh, Amy Coney at that point in time, uh, co-authored this law review article about Catholic judges and the death penalty. And she talks about what to do because Catholic teaching on the death penalty is absolutely very, very clear. And she, she explains what a devout Catholic judge like herself ought to do. And she specifically says that there's no way the judge can do his duty and obey his conscience, right? So the judge is unable to impose the death penalty because Catholic law says they can't. And she goes on to say, like, this is not a difficult case. The Catholic judge has to recuse themselves. OK, so she's saying that there's this conflict between her beliefs and the law. And so to get around that, the Catholic judge has to not sit on the case. OK, she's been a judge for three years. Uh, she was talking about death penalty cases. She was also talking about abortion cases and that she's handled those cases and she hasn't recused herself. And is there any examples of any decisions she made that is um, says that shows us that she is an ideological she she makes these decisions based on her uh, religious views? I mean, absolutely. She In that article, she says that she would have to decide those cases based on her religion. And yeah, but so, are there any examples yeah, of any yeah, cases? There, yeah, there are. And there's so there's two abortion cases, and she decides the cases. She's in the minority, and she doesn't win out because her view is not the law, because it's a religious view that conflicts with the law. Now, she doesn't say, you can't do this because my God says so. She's more uh, intelligent than that doesn't do that but she's laid it out very clearly for us in this law review article why she's deciding those cases in that way and the simple fact that she's not recusing us tells us what she's doing and this is just this law review article is just one piece of evidence right there's there's actually quite a bit more um quite a bit more i mean you've got uh in 2015 she found, she signed a letter from catholic women to the Synod Fathers in Christ. Um, and in it, hang on, let me get the quote right here. I have it. Uh, she, ex the, the women expressed our fidelity to and gratitude for the doctrines of the Catholic Church and confidence in the Synod of Bishops as it strives to strengthen the church's evangelizing mission. And then it went on to raise a number of topics that are going to come before Barrett as a judge, reproductive justice, LGBTQ rights, gender issues. So again, you have her writing 
saying that when these issues come up, we're guided by the doctrines of the church. And that is how she decided. Again, she's not stupid enough to say the Bible and the, the Pope have told me I have to decide this way. She, will, she would never do that. But she is deciding the way that her church dictates to. And again, that's just one. They enthusiastically commit their distinctive insights and gifts and our fervent prayers in service of the church's evangelizing mission. Okay. And then the, the big one that I think probably people have heard about is uh, the 2006 commencement speech that she gave at Notre Dame Law School. And she said that the, her legal career, the, anybody's legal career, is but a means to an end. And that end is building the kingdom of God. Yeah. I Oof. mean, that, that's, that's pretty clear. Now, I, there are, I, just to, to be fair to the other side, there are people who say, like, that was metaphorical. Uh, you know, it, it's not really talking about a takeover, a theocratic takeover of secular institutions. And that is not borne out by her membership in that cultish organization that I mentioned, which is called People of Praise. Uh, and if you look at what People of Praise does, I mean, it, they, and I actually found a magazine uh, that they publish um, and published right uh, the month before she was nominated. And they talk about what the kingdom of God means in this magazine article. And they're very, very clear. They they specifically say that it includes a takeover of criminal and uh, courts of criminal and justice. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's very, very clear what she is getting at here. And uh, it, go ahead. It, it's very similar to the cult that this uh, Handmaid's Tale story started with. The the, or, the original cult that was eventually responsible for everything that happened. That original that origin story it seems like exactly the cult that this lady belongs to. I mean, I'm not saying that it's I'm not making the slippery slope argument that it's going to lead to that, like some people are. But I'm just saying that that just that cult is just very similar to that. No, you're 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 right. And there was a big kind of kerfuffle over how much um, the the actual novel by Margaret Atwood was influenced by this group in particular, uh, which, and however you shake out, People of Praise teaches that men have authority over their wives. Members are supposed to swear a lifelong loyalty oath. They're expe expected to donate 5% of their salaries. The magazine that I was referring to specifically called Amy Coney Barrett's mom a handmaid. So whether or not it was the the inspiration right. for the novel, the, the analogy <laughs> is pretty clear and uh, and very obvious if you're you're Do you looking know, at it. I know what conservatives push back. I listen to a lot of right wing uh, content creators, so I know I know what the pushback on this is. Like they're saying, look at these Democrats; they're such hypocrites. Mm -hmm. They're they're so stupid. They don't see like we are we're putting a woman at one of the highest offices in the land, and they're saying that we're gonna uh, this is gonna lead to Handmaid's Tale. Like is this is the exact opposite of that? We're giving a woman such a high position of authority, but actually, if you if you actually do follow the Handmaid's Tale story. It, that's how it started. That's like exactly. it was a whoop. That's exactly how it started. It was a woman that they were using, and she was going out, and like they did believe the part of their teaching was that women shouldn't be in power and they should listen to men. But they weren't doing that when they were uh, when they were using this lady to go out and do all their propaganda and all the arguments and all the policies. But eventually, when they did become to power, the same lady that was doing. Uh, the same woman that was doing all the advertising and all the legal work and all the activism eventually had to be turned into nothing but a housewife. So, so it, it doesn't actually contradict that ham uh, that argument. But yeah, well, and we should be—I mean, we should be clear. Like, I'm pretty certain the reason they wanted this woman in particular on the court was to write the decision that overturns Roe versus Wade. Mm -hmm. They they want that to come from a woman for that exact sort of superficial shield to be able to say yeah. oh, how can how can this be an anti-woman decision a woman wrote it that's exactly what that's what are the chances of that actually happening if she gets on it's going to happen it's happening it's inevitable look, look you have to look, you know all these challenges have been having in the happening in these state courts right against abortion right, where they're sorry can you guys hear me okay yeah yeah so there's yeah, there's all these challenges that are happening, cracking down on it, increasing restrictions. Eventually, they're trying to get it to the Supreme Court. It was probably going to happen even just with the, the new majority anyway, right, with the uh, appointment of, of Kavanaugh. 
But now you have a 6-3 majority, and they're going to put it up there. There's no way that they're not going to rule against it. It's over. Like Roe v. Wade, if she's on, Roe v. Wade and Obamacare for sure, for sure, are, are done. But what about what happened to set like not going against a president that has already been set and not overdoing like undoing she that like what said it herself that she doesn't uh, care for that she wants to interpret the constitution and if that mm -hmm. contradicts the precedent she's going to choose the constitutional thing or whatever however she wants to interpret it yeah i mean I, I i agree with that analysis ali and you know again it goes back to the central conflict that that she has shown a very clear pattern of Right. You know, right. Like, let, let's go back to that kingdom of God uh, example. She says that in 2006 during this uh, this commencement speech and her the the cultish organization that she is a part of, uh, you know, is running articles the month before she's nominated. And I, I pulled up. So if anybody's interested in all this evidence, I know I'm kind of throwing a lot out there. I did a big tweet thread on September 26 with all this in it. You did, um, yeah. People can go look at it. But um this is what they wrote in that magazine right then. And it was, they were exerting it from an earlier speech, but they published it again the month before she was nominated. God is really interested, not just in men's souls, but also in their whole life work and enterprise. He wants all of it transformed into his kingdom. This means that what we often see as secular or worldly, and then it goes on to make a list here, including jobs, career, et cetera, criminal justice and the courts are all meant to be transformed into the kingdom of God in the earth, right? Like that is not metaphorical. That is the language of Christian nationalism. We are turning this into a Christian nation. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that is what that is what's going to happen with the opinions that they write. Precedent goes out the window. They got six votes for it. Why would they follow it? They're not going to. They don't care. Yeah. So I so okay so we have a good idea of who, who we're dealing with and who this person is. Um, now I I just want to talk about that. What is actionable here? So I am a little cynical about this, Andrew. Like so, you know, I know you said that we can fight against it, and um, you know, the weather. It's up. Not can we, fight. Have to fight. I mean, the, fight. the only way that we definitely lose is if we don't fight. Right, like no, I, I agree we, we might lose, but we will absolutely lose if we don't fight. But right. I, yeah. I know you're. I'm being a little bit of a, a dick here. Continue. No, 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 no. <laughs> you're you're perfectly fine. Right. I I did. Uh, you, you are right. I should rephrase that. But we do have to fight. Everybody has to fight. But um, just look. If the shoe was on the other foot, and the Democrats had a chance to have a six-three liberal majority court, and you know it was four weeks before the election, the filibuster didn't exist, and their candidate had a really good chance of losing, um, then. This is something that I think anybody would do. This is I know that uh, there's this argument about it being illegitimate. It's ethically, morally illegitimate. It completely, it can actually throw the whole reputation and the integrity of the Supreme Court. Um, it, it puts all of that into question. That it's a it's a big issue. I agree with all of that, but I mean, what are the constitutional and legal impediments to actually pushing this process through? I mean, I'm. I feel like there is a place to fight against this, but the way to fight against it's like the impeachment. You know how you know we're, we're doing the whole impeachment. Yes, it's important to impeach Trump. He asked a foreign power to do opera research on his, you know, political opponent in the U.S., which is insane. It is completely impeachable. But everybody knew that he wasn't going to be convicted. You know, and now it's. Uh, it, are the Democrats doing that again? Are they going down down that line again? Or do they have they should they have another strategy that they should be pushing forward with? Yeah. So um, I'll t I'll talk a little bit. So just so everybody knows, in my in my day job, um, I do we the organization I work for, which I'm not going to name here because I'm here in my personal capacity right now. As you can tell by how political I've gotten, we are allowed to oppose Supreme Court nominees, and we are my organization is. Uh, and as part of that, I sit on a lot of uh, national conferences and committee boards. I'm on calls every single day where we're literally every single day. First thing in the morning, we have a rapid res response call. We talk about uh, what is happening, uh, changes that we are seeing, cracks that we are seeing on the other side and the best strategies to oppose it and how that can happen in the political realm, but then also with the people. And mm -hmm. I mean, there there are a number of strategies and it it is illegitimate on its own terms. This entire nomination is illegitimate on its own terms because the Republicans set a new rule. They invented this new rule uh, with Merrick Garland. No, you know, no, no president gets to appoint a Supreme Court nominee in an election year. 
uh, and they are now going back on that rule. So they stole either that seat or they're stealing this seat. There's no other, there's no two ways about it. In my opinion, they've stolen them both. Well, they've stolen them both. They don't yeah. care. They, they don't, don't care. care. There's a rule that wasn't they don't a care. Law. You're absolutely right. Yeah. It wasn't like a legal ruling that they did in, in 2016. Correct. That and and that is that's the big problem uh, because really all it is is Senate rules and the Republicans control the Senate so they can just change yeah. the rules. Sorry, sorry, Andrew, I'm going to interrupt for a second. And this is something that Armin brought up last time. It, it can't, can't you? Can't we also say that the Democrats at that time? And this, by the way, I'm 100 percent on your side. I'm right now incensed about this but just to be fair didn't the democrats also have this rule that you know we we should be able to appoint somebody i know that was in february and this is four weeks before the election yeah. so wouldn't you say that they're both kind of doing that because it's their own in, in their own self-interest no i mean i mean they like that was that was the rule the rule was yeah i mean it's not a problem to appoint i was outraged that they held the merrick garland seat open for that long because that had not been done before it was perfectly normal to allow a president and for the Senate to go ahead and confirm that person. They changed that rule and now they're changing it back. And again, it's not an actual written rule, uh, but it is, it's, it's one of the norms. And this is kind of what we were talking about in the pre-show. So maybe we get into that in a minute, but um, the, the, the question right now that I'm struggling with and that I don't know what the answer to is going to be is, this is not a legitimate process in the eyes of most Americans. Uh, most Americans think the seat should remain open until the next president or until the election right. is over and we know who the next president is. Uh, so basically till after the inauguration is the better way to say it. Um, and poll after poll has now shown that. Um, so um, this is what Americans want. This is, they listened to Mitch McConnell back in 2016. Um, so this is not a legitimate process. And the question is, so how do the Democrats deal with that? Should they even participate in the process? You know, should Mitch McConnell and the, De uh, or excuse me, should uh, Chuck Schumer and the Dems be playing Mitch McConnell's game? Because if they play the game, are they somehow legitimizing it? And I mean, these are big questions that, um, are being discussed and talked about. And, uh, you know, I, I can see arguments for both sides. I think, um, Well, I'm trying not to give away any secrets here. I mean, I I, th I think there's a good argument to be made for not participating in this at all on a senator level. Sending in somebody to gum up the works, a staffer, uh, somebody to question maybe into the hearings to gum up the works and drag things out and slow things down, unanimous consent on everything, um, maybe even... I mean, the House has some power oh, here can, too. Can you explain that, the unanimous consent of the quorum thing? Because that is a strategy that... I, for some reason, it feels like they don't want to do, and I don't know why they don't want to do it, but how uh, does it work to stall? So, it? so two things. One, um, everything I've heard, they're willing to pull out all the stops here. Um, so I, I don't, I haven't heard anything to the contrary that they're not going to um, refuse to do unanimous consent or anything because it may be unpalatable. Uh, and I, for, I, first of all, I'm no expert in parliamentary procedure, but uh, my understanding of unanimous consent is normally uh, the Senate can move on with every, all the little minor things that it has to do each day without every single Senator having to vote on whether to, or not to move on to the next item on the agenda. Okay. Um, Asking any senator, though, can ask for unanimous consent on any one of those items, and then the whole Senate has to vote on it. Um, and it really, really slows things down because they have to then have time to vote, and you know, depending, people may say no, and then you don't get to move on. So um, it's it's a way to really take multiply by 10, 20, 50, the time it would take to do just even the most basic things. Uh, that's a, that's an oversimplification on my part. I'm sure there's better explainer out there uh, than what I just did, but that that's mm. the basic concept. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. Um, yeah go ahead, Armin. I do want to also mention, uh, ask, um, spend a little, a little bit of time on um, talking about what this does to gay rights. Um, and how it could challenge that. And would it go as far as, I mean, I can't imagine that happening, but maybe you guys can, um, making gay marriage not legal again? Is that what, is that possible? Is that within the realm of possibility? Yeah. Yeah. It is? How? Look, okay, Anthony Kennedy was the swing vote exactly. on gay marriage. 
Right. Um, he's he's gone. Um, let, let's do it like this. John Roberts now is known sort of as a moderate, which is not close to true. Okay, super conservative. I mean, as conservative as they come, he's done a couple things correctly this term um, to strengthen the idea that his court is legitimate. That is the only reason he's done them. He's playing a long game. The good decisions that he made this term uh, left questions open. So there was this trans rights case that was decided that everybody was excited about. It, it's great. It's a good victory. We should take it. But they specifically left open a question about religious freedom in there, about whether or not uh, people who believe their God says uh, there's no such thing as trans people can then go ahead and discriminate. They left that question open. And there's no doubt about which way they're going to decide it. Okay. The, the abortion rights case that they decided this term is the, literally the exact same case as the case they decided three years ago. Uh, so June Medical was the same case as Whole Woman's Health. It was literally the law that was challenged was literally verbatim exactly the same. Roberts was just saying, look, you can't, I can't do something we just agreed not to do three years ago. That, that That's like too much. It's literally exactly, give me anything different and I'll give you the overturning of Roe versus Wade that you want. But it can't be the exact same case. Roberts... In the Obergefell decision, which is the gay marriage case, okay, this is our conservative guy. This is the only time he has ever stood up and read a dissent from the bench, okay? That is how pissed he was about that decision and how wrong he thinks it is. And since that time, you've got Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and now Barrett on the court, and Barrett replacing Ginsburg and Kennedy gone. I mean, the, bo the votes for that have flipped. I mean, the. Can I just name, like, so you have, now you're going to have on the Supreme Court, you're going to have uh, Roberts, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, Clarence Thomas, um, uh, this guy, uh, John Roberts, and. Alito. Uh, and uh, Samuel Alito. There's going to be six people, uh, and four of which have already opposed and voted against the uh, same sex marriage legalization in 2015. And now you have uh, two more. So it's. I but it doesn't make okay but this has becomes like i can't even imagine it's what unthinkable and it's so unimaginable but i mean would it be there would be riots like real riots like to at a level that i i mean this has become normalized this is even conservatives now accept uh gay marriage and they moved on to like being anti-trans instead like I mean, come on, like, I can't, but, but I can't so imagine, like, like, wouldn't they burn the court down, the Supreme I mean, Court I, down if that happens? I, okay. like, that's something that I, I would, I would, um, well, I'll, I'm going to bite my tongue on that one. But, but again, Armin, like, don't think about it as it happening the day after Amy Coney Barrett is put on the court, though, after the election, they are hearing some really important cases, including an Obamacare case. Um, they're going to probably be hearing an election case about the, presidential election. Uh, Trump has specifically said he wants his justice in there before then to help him win the election. Uh, you know, there they're going to be these massive cases. And let's say Ali and I are right that Roe gets overturned. And let's say that happens in the first year or the second year. She's going to be on the court for 40 years. I mean, justice, the next oldest person on that court is Breyer, who's one of the liberals. Uh, so if Imagine a landscape in three or four years where Roe versus Wade is gone, where trans rights have been rolled back, and the, a lot of the progress we made has slipped away. And it's not all of a sudden this unthinkable, unimaginable thing because they've been laying the groundwork for it in this case, in that case. And yeah, they're coming for contraception after that. They're coming for gay marriage after that. I mean, this is why I said at the beginning, everything is at stake. Yeah, it's. Uh, can we? Can we just? Can, for wait, no, can we? Can we? Can we acknowledge? Can after what Andrew just said here? Can we just do a shout out to the people that 
didn't vote for Hillary because they're all just the same. They're all just to the people that voted for Jill Stein, to the people that didn't like we're like, oh, they're all politicians. All I'm not gonna choose the lesser evil. How do you like it now? Huh? How do you like how do you like the results? Like, I mean, are they coming are there, are those people coming out right now and like openly admitting what a big mistake they have made, or are they just like hiding and not talking about this? Because they need to be called out. I think they need to do the right thing now. I mean, I, I, I'm pissed at them and I'm angry, but I care more about what they do right now. And I, to anybody who's in that boat and feeling affronted right now, look, there is you are never, ever, ever in the history of politics going to agree with every, with every single issue of a particular candidate unless you get off your ass and run for office yourself. That's the only time you're going to be in 100% agreement with a candidate. So if that is what you are looking for, then you need to run for office. Otherwise, you are picking the lesser of two evils, okay? And you've got to, you cannot let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And so many people did that in 2016. And I think partly it was because nobody believed that a Trump presidency was a possibility. Uh, and hopefully nobody's being that stupid this time. But uh, seriously, it, this is not a time to vote third party. This man is toying with the integrity of our election. And it, there needs to be such an overwhelming, just tsunami against him that there's no even shred of believability to all the bullshit that he is going to claim happened. Because he's going to do it. So don't vote third party. Right. That's what I'm saying. Vote Biden. Vote Biden. Yeah. Um, there was this quote I'm trying to look up. There's no, there are no solutions. There are only trade offs. Thomas Sowell. Mm -hmm. So well. That's what he said. Yeah. Yeah. But go on, Ellie. Yeah. I have, um, hey, I just wanted to say for perspective uh, for people who are wondering about the extent of this. Uh, the, the, you, do you know when uh, Amy Coney Barrett is going to be the age that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was when she died? She's going to be that age in 2059. I was going to oh. say 2060. Yeah. Yeah, 2059. Wow. So, so what we're talking about is she lives to 87. She's on the Supreme Court like Ruth Bader Ginsburg was. She is here until 2059. So I think that you know Mitch McConnell, uh, whose main priority, and he's been, he's probably been the most successful. Senate Majority Leader in recent history when it comes to this is that he has just completely transformed the judiciary um, just in terms of appointing federal uh, conservative federal judges. Because one of the biggest problems was that, you know, when Ronald Reagan and some of these other conservative presidents appointed judges, a lot of times they ended up not really being that conservatives. Yeah, and they ended up being on the liberal side like, you know, David Su was it David Souter? Yeah, David Souter is the that's big that. one that they, they are so, yeah. still so pissed off about. So McConnell has been really trying to prioritize getting actual, real conservative people who will be loyal to conservative ideology there, and uh, he has, and they're they're nominating younger people. So that is what's at stake. I, I I know this feels like oh, it's just another Supreme Court appointment, but this is actually massive, not just for the U.S., but it's massive for the rest of the world too. It's so bizarre to me that the such a position people that have so much influence have so much power and control over what happens in people's personal lives is being done from a not elected position like this is a these are these are people that have lifetime uh, they're given a lifetime authority to decide what people get to do and not to do and they're not even elected by people like how is how does this happen like why is this yeah. But can I can I add something to that? And I yeah, no, I I want to add something to that and maybe kind of explore this for a few minutes, and then after that, I do want to kind of get to the stacking the courts and that strategy. But um, so what Armin is saying, just overall, uh, and I talked to you about this before, that it's it's amazing to me last four years what it's really exposed is how much of the U.S. system and democracy works on good faith uh, rather than any legal binding. I mean, the president can really get away with anything. If they're if they're not self regulating, there's nothing legal holding them down to it. We've seen that with with Trump. But let's see. You have the Electoral College. I mean, the U.S. president is not elected democratically. They're elected constitutionally. You've got a handful of states, just a few states, that decide the election. The rest of the people 
just functionally their votes don't really count. Then you have a Senate where 18% of the U.S. population you know, elects 50% of senators. And that is your governing body, your main governing body. Uh, these are the people who approve the, the uh, Supreme Court justices. Um, going back to the Electoral College, I mean, Nate Silver actually calculated this, that if Biden wins the election by 1%, he has an, only a six percent chance of being president, right? So if you if, if he actually wins the election by one percent, there's a ninety four percent chance that Trump will be president. Right? So this is you got these sort of um, and, she, and then Ruth Bader Ginsburg, one eighty seven year old woman, she died, and the entire future of the U.S. and the U.S. democracy and everything that achieved civil rights, everything is at stake from this, and all this power was basically because this one woman was hanging on. So just well, overall, I mean, the, the, to Armin's question, Andrew, like, what is this, uh, you know, I, I know this revelation, I, I know that you share this with me in terms of, you know, what democracy really means and all this stuff. And how do you see this? Like, has it made you reconsider anything? Or oh, yeah, side? man. <laughs> yeah. The last four years have been a revelation for me. I mean, it's the, it's, I think it's the only the only silver lining in, in the entire Trump presidency. And let's let's pause for a second too, because like that the the weight that was on Ruth Bader Ginsburg's shoulders to just fucking stay alive, right? Should not be there. That shouldn't be the case where we are where Ruth Bader Ginsburg needs to survive for another 45 days so that our country doesn't she could have stepped chaos. down during obama i mean I, I i don't personally buy that she i think some of her finest decisions uh came in the last four years and again the reason nobody like nobody expected trump to win the reason they proposed merrick garland and didn't push for it is because they were hoping to nominate somebody more liberal later on when hillary won like it it wasn't nobody was really the democrats blew it a little bit there um but Going back to the the question, right? Like I, I've thought about this so much in the past four years. I have become, for lack of a better word, you know, radicalized uh, under the Trump administration. Where I would never have said, never would have said in 2015 that the Senate Senate is an undemocratic body that needs to be abolished. But I do believe that to be the case now. Uh, it, it is it is fundamentally an undem uh, anti democratic body. Um, the Electoral College was a little bit easier. I was skeptical of that for a long time. Um, now, having learned so much more about it, you know, it is very clearly a relic of slavery, and it is absolutely fundamentally undemocratic and has got to go. Um, there is, if people are interested, there is actually a pact um, that several states have, already, uh, I don't remember what the number is, I think it's 30 plus now states have signed on to, um, where they are agreeing to apportion their electoral college votes as the popular vote shakes out in their state, which would effectively neuter the electoral college without having to amend the constitution to neuter the electoral college. But also a little alarming to just have that be the thing that's, that's sitting out there, uh, keeping us all honest, far better to, to get rid of it. Point being this, Trump does not give a shit about norms. He has blown up all the norms. Uh, and and that is what so much of our system depended on to function. Uh, right? This was written by old white guys who believed themselves to be gentlemen. And they believed themselves to be really a superior class in a number of different ways. And they relied on that. And they, <laughs> they ran this country for a really long time. And all of those norms have been just dynamited with not just Trump too. I mean, McConnell's responsible for, for a lot of it. And I think we need to talk about in the wake of this massive, massive structural reform just across the board. How much of it, how much of it though is actionable? So let's, let's talk about that. Like right now getting rid of the electoral college, I mean, that's definitely a long-term goal. Maybe, you know, that requires like a, a huge majority of, to, to get that done, abolishing the Senate. I mean, these are we're talking right now. So you have the Supreme Court. We're talk, we talk about yeah. the stalling tactics, like you know, we talk about you know, this consent. Um, there is a threat right now of uh, Democrats uh, abolishing the legislative filibuster, 
right? So that you can just pass things with a 51 majority, the way they do the Supreme Court judges, and then adding four more seats to the Supreme Court, uh, which will be, you know, filled by the Democratic president. Um, how, that seems like something that is more achievable and more actionable in the short term. Yeah. Um, and so what do you think about that? What do you think the immediate short-term strategy right now should be in terms of, uh, you know, stalling and, and going ahead? Yeah, there. I mean, there's two big things that have to happen. I mean, we, we talked a little bit about Trump judges outside of the Supreme Court, but the, the number one thing that has to happen is there has to be an immediate fix for the federal judiciary. Uh, by the end of... Trump's term, we're talking probably 250 judges. They're at 210 right now. There's another 40 nominees that are up. I mean, that, that's massive. Uh, that should be between a quarter and a third of the entire federal judiciary. Um, already not known for being the most progressive uh, body in, in the country. So any plans that would be proposed to fix our democracy would have to survive in a hostile federal judiciary. So I think the number one thing that has to be done is fix Supreme Court, stack it, don't care. The idea that then it becomes an arm race, arms race, and then they're going to stack it when they get their chance. Fine. I don't care about that. I also don't think it will happen for a reason I'll get to in a second. Um, but it's also not just the Supreme Court. Circuit courts need to be expanded and stacked. District courts need to be expanded and stacked too. Okay. Uh, massive stacking, like massive, massive. The, the federal courts are completely overworked as it is. You could double the size of the federal court system tomorrow and they still probably wouldn't catch up on all the backlog for like two years. That's how, probably maybe even three years. Um, and then we got to talk about other democratic reforms. DC needs to be a state. Puerto Rico needs to be a state. I mean, there uh, HR1 his, it was the first bill uh, that was proposed in 2018 Congress. Everybody ought to go read that. There's a lot of good suggestions in there. I think it's a good starting point. There's a lot more. And if you can get those done and they can survive in the court system, the Republicans never have power again. Right? What they are doing right now is working to solidify minority rule. Right? They are not a majority in this country. They are using the structures that to their advantage, to their massive advantage that allow them to maintain minority rule. That is where we are right now. Hence the focus on the judiciary, right? Yeah. I mean, that's why, yeah. because like, the majority of the U.S. now is liberal. They know that the only way they can do things is actually just finding the minority conservatives. And this that's exactly why they're doing it. So uh, so if yeah. if you can do those two things, though, you don't have to worry about the, the Republicans coming back and then, OK, well, we're going to stack the courts because you stack the courts. They're never going to be in power again. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. Armin. It's it's scary. It's dangerous though. What if you're wrong? Like then it could backfire. I mean, the Democrats keep doing things and then it backfires massively when they lose the power. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. Are you, yeah. I mean, other That's things right. you can do. Here's another thing. The Supreme Court said that gerrymandering, uh, political gerrymandering is okay, right? Yeah. So you can gerrymander a state to say that Republicans don't uh, have any, you know, districts that are going to be heavy Republican. California, Oregon, and Washington should gerrymander themselves to high hell, and there should not be a single Republican that ever comes from the West Coast and sits in the House of Representatives again. I don't like it, but it's legal. Right. But it's so it's so bizarre, though, that how um, the average, you know, the average opinion of American is moving in one direction, but the politics... Is moving in the exact opposite direction. Like this is like doesn't you know, seem to be reflecting. Yeah. I mean, I think I always talk about they're raging against the dying of their privilege is what's happening, mm. and I, I I mean that in the sense that they are used to. But they're winning. It, yeah, I mean, right mm. now they are. I, I mean, they're doing the, the way I the way I talk about it is they're doing massive damage right now, mm. and I don't yet think though we are really damn close we are at the spot where the United States cannot recover from the damage that's been done. So uh, what's it? Like, if, if, I mean, if, Biden, if Biden doesn't win, that is it. That's game over. That's over. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. I don't know. But what's the divide? Like, how is this divide? Like, I, I mean, I see a lot of people fear mongering and I don't want to, you know, they seem to be, they, they keep to suggesting that there's going to be like chaos. Like, I mean, What's the worst case scenario? Like, if the, if people are so far away from what the government is going to represent the United States, like, how do you like? Can you give us like 
what is it, like is all this well like, people are talking about what happens in that case right. yeah is revolution that's historic i mean that that is where you get to that is how you get to revolutions where the government moves so far away from the popular will that's what yeah. that's that's generally what happens I'm not saying it's going to. I'm just talking right. about history. Here. No, but okay, but I keep hearing that and I just don't know like I just feel like that's a little bit of a hyperbole going on here. People are talking about a civil war and I'm like, yeah, I don't know what you guys like you guys well, seem to be. So I was chatting with Jeff Charlotte on Twitter the other day. Well, I actually I don't know when it was cuz what is time even in this current hell? <laughs> no, that's another it? old episode. Yeah. <laughs> so, but but I w- he was saying, look, I like the idea of having sort of like a truth and reconciliation committee to hold Trump and all of his cronies accountable for all the crimes they've committed. But I don't think we should do it because I, he's legitimately worried about a civil war. It, it, like, and in his mind, this is like as close as, as we've come since the previous yeah. civil war i i, I actually yeah, sorry go ahead well I, I mean and i kind of disagreed with him and we, we didn't really reach a, a a conclusion but you know for, for me i don't think we can re- help help restore all those norms that we were talking about trump destroying without some sort of accountability because if you don't have that accountability it tells everybody right. who in the future is going to hold office that they can get away with these things if they do it to a high enough degree mm-hmm. And that that right. is not a thing that you can have hanging. There there has to be accountability for us to survive. Ali, we need to be strict with this. I need you to go to the patron questions. I need you to read them fast, and I need to get short answers to them. Okay, okay, okay. I'll do I'll do that. But short I wa- answers. I gotta say one thing before. Um, I think that uh, that I don't I actually don't think it's uh, hyperbole at all. I think you know you're. Go. We've already talked about how this is not really a democratic system, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. And when you have minority rule and the majority of the population is not with it, that is exactly, I think, what you were saying. That is that is how revolutions happen, especially in a place like the U.S., such an animated electorate. Okay, let's do it. Patron questions, everybody. Um, are you going to highlight them or am I highlighting them? Okay, Jim King has got the first one, 10, 10, 1042, Armin. What are the chances Democrats can make uh, her, I guess, uh, uh, Cody Accused. Barrett, recuse yeah. herself uh, on any ruling on the election? Yeah, great question. Great, great question. Yeah. She should, and I, if the Democrats go to the hearing or if they ask questions at the hearing, I expect that to be a very popular thing that they tried to pin her down on. Uh, the election is ongoing right now, uh, and it, there, there's a good argument to be, well, yeah, that that her legitimacy depends on the outcome of the election. There's a good argument to be made on that. They will, she will say, no, I was nominated before, I was confirmed before. That's what that, that's why they're trying to rush it through before the election actually mm-hmm. happens. Also, because it looks even worse when Trump doesn't win and they can get it, they uh, are finishing up his nomination. So, I mean that that's something that I would expect to see, but I don't know what the chances are of it happening. Um, uh, also from Jim, will it be Roe v. Wade overturned or chipped away so it's only effectively gone? Oh. I think they're gonna. I think they're gonna. The, the conventional wisdom says chipped away at, but I think now they're gonna go whole hog. Oh yeah, I, I think it's overturned. It's it's absolutely it's gonna go. Um, Mars is saying, worst come to worst, what recourse do we have in falling back to states' rights? <laughs> no, states' rights only exist for the Republicans, not for anybody else. <laughs> I'm, okay. yeah, I mean, so many things they're talking about are con- are going to be constitutional rights, uh, like yeah. First Amendment rights that supersede uh, states' rights. So, yeah. Uh, uh, next question: It is it is constitutional, but there are lots of shit things that are constitutional. Best thing seems to be to show how unethical it is during an election. Yeah, this is. Um, I mean, I guess this is a comment more than a question. But I, I, I don't know, How, is it really like, you know, you show that things are, I guess I'll ask the question here. You, you show that things are unethical, you know, this is wrong, don't do this, don't do that. But, you know, ultimately, it's like the impeachment thing. If it happens, I'll, it's going to happen. Like, uh, how much does it really harm things in the kind of world that we're living in now? Yeah, I mean, I, again, I think it goes back to saying that this is not just a battle for this seat, but a war for the judiciary. And then even bigger than that, a war for our democracy. It's much bigger than Barrett. This is about justice. And, you know, mm-hmm. I'm never going to stop fighting for justice. And I think anybody out there listening to this better get on that train with me. Yeah. Okay, so uh, with Trump taxes released, the Woodward tape, calling the military uh, suckers and losers, being behind in polls, 
What will it take for Republican senators to distance themselves and not cons- uh, con- not confirm? So I guess they're feeling a loss. They're like, okay, if this is impending loss, should we, should we confirm or not? Yeah, it, it's going to take pressure from citizens. Massive, massive pressure from citizens is what is going to stop Republicans from doing the wrong thing here or possibly an outbreak of COVID on the floor. I mean, it, it, the one thing is they appear united, but that is, those are just appearances. Uh, and again, think back to the ACA 2017, think back to John McCain. It is possible, um, but it's only possible if we fight. But, but, uh, but uh, Andrew, if they, if, if they think they're going to lose this anyway, the polls and Woodward tapes, all this other stuff, tax, everything is going to come out and supposing the debates go well, if they think they're going to lose it anyway, aren't they going to think, okay, well, let's get one win. Let's get this woman on the Supreme Court for the next 30 years. We'll lose the, we're losing the election anyway. Wouldn't, couldn't they think Maybe. that way? I mean, yeah, they, they might think that way. Out. They might think that way, but what the, where does that leave you? Okay, well, Ooh. I'm not going to fight because if we, if we fight and like, we're, like there's, there's no way to game that out. The only thing you can do is put as much pressure on them as possible. Um, like, so for instance, uh, you know, Cory Gardner probably signed on to sit voting yes, because he wants a lucrative lobbying position in DC for, to be with the Republicans later on. But if we can ensure that Republicans never have power again, you know, point being the, the only thing you can do is fight. You can't game out the politics. You and I don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. We're in the middle of a pandemic. So many things can happen. Right. The only thing that you have control over is standing up and saying this is wrong and calling your senators. So that's what you need to be doing, not worrying about the politics of it. We do, we aren't the politicians. Okay. Uh, with the full faith and the credit clause, if same-sex marriage is allowed in one state, how would another state not recognize that marriage? Uh, this is, I mean, go back and read a lot of the briefing on this. This is one of the central arguments in the Obergefell cases and the cases leading up to it, um, where you had civil unions. Uh, I mean, essentially the argument is that it's not, it's not a legitimate marriage. Um, uh, there are, <laughs> there's no real slow way to do that. It, it goes back to them not really caring. Um, and you're going to you're going to be in a state that is super conservative that's going to be saying that anyway, and they're going to control things in other ways. The, uh, I would I would just direct Jim. You got to go back and read a lot of the briefing, and go back and read some of the old stories that they that was the argument for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, Susanna mentions um, <laughs> this uh, when, when, point, posted this comment. She said, "Oh no, honey, not radicalized." I've, uh, when you mentioned that you're giving radicals, I think she's also uh, pointed out in some other shows that we had that she doesn't like uh, when AOC sh- sh- said that, like "go get radicalized" or something like that. She, is she uh, Susanna is like a former Antifa. Mm-hmm. She's like ex Antifa, and she thinks that that kind of language is dangerous. I mean, I think it uh, plays. She, I think it plays into the the other side narrative probably uh right. and I'm, I'm open to suggestions susanna it's not it's not that it just um it's not the other side that i think it's our main concern it's um the left the the antifa people and it actually does a lot of people read into that actually being an encouragement uh, the people that are for the rioting and the looting and the violence they see that as a dog whistle to them and an encouragement to them to actually do go beyond just politics and speech, right? So I think that she's because she's part of these groups of people, she sees like that is they see that as people actually hint, hint, winking to them, like, yeah, this is the time for that. So I think that's yeah. The time, the time is to vote. Voting is not enough. Uh, you know, everybody, uh, that is sort of my mantra. Like, voting was not enough in 2016. You got to be out there getting other people to vote, uh, doing whatever you can. I'm volunteering for the Biden campaign every, every day, pretty much, um, or doing podcasts like this, where I'm just trying to, to get people to, to take political action. I mean, voting is no longer enough. Unfortunately, you got to do right. So that's what you mean. But she's again, Susanna saying it's generally dangerous language, no matter who it comes from. So that's what she uh, yeah. is saying. Go well, we've got a minute left. There's some weirdo named Armin Navabi who's got a question saying, you know, why are there so many Catholics on the Supreme Court? And just to <laughs> give context, to that's a very good question. Because yeah. and it's especially important right now because Republicans are talking about all this anti-Catholic bias. Uh, uh, John Roberts, Samuel Alito, Clarence Thomas, Kavanaugh, Sotomayor, uh, they're all Catholic. Gorsuch was raised Catholic. 
Uh, Nancy Pelosi is a Catholic. Joe Biden is a Catholic who actually, you know, it, it's so all of these guys are Catholic, but there's a weird thing about it. There's no anti-Catholic. According to the Catholic Church, Gorsuch is still a Catholic. You can't leave once you're in. There you go. It's like the mafia. So, um, yeah. But what guys, 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 one, one, one thing. If you are watching, if you're listening to the audio version of this, the public version of this, please consider becoming a patron. And if you are a patron, you can join us live and ask your questions. Um, and we're going to read your questions at the end of every show. Um, by the way, um, Jim is saying... Uh, Sado is really uh, is a really smart dude. Enjoyed this one a lot. And Susanna is saying, Andrew, your efforts are appreciated. Thank you both very much. And, and guys, get, follow, follow, yeah, follow get, Andrew. Follow us and get in touch with us. Andrew, Andrew, let us know later on. Just send me messages. Anything that you want us to do. I know we're foreigners, but uh, we're definitely invested in this. <laughs> Half of my family lives in the U.S. Okay, I'm a nieces, nephews, everything. So, uh, and I, I'll tell you those stories later. But my God, like, so yeah. Do you and follow room? Andrew on Twitter. He has like a lot more detailed and nuanced takes on this, like way before, way more than what we could do in this episode. Okay. So link nuance. link to his Twitter is yeah. <laughs> Twitter's where nuance goes to die. Okay. No, and you do lie. no, you do long threads. You, it doesn't have to be just one tweet. You could do like an entire blog post on Twitter, one tweet after another. So I don't yeah. know. Yeah, you could do that. But anyways, follow tw uh, follow Andrew on Twitter. Uh, link in the description. Uh, yes, buy his book. Buy his book. The Secular Jihadists have been made possible thanks to the Illuminati and the covert support of Israel and the CIA. That's what we have been told, but we haven't received our checks yet. If you like what we do, please support us. Share the podcast with your friends, write and tweet us with topic and guest suggestions, or head over to secularjihadists.com and give a dollar or more for exclusive access to live video. Have your questions read and answered on the air and more. Till next time, may the flying spaghetti monster be with you.